Good morning. Uh, my name is John Donaldson. I'm the pastor of Burns Memorial United Methodist Church in Augusta, Georgia. It is April 12th, 2020, and I am so happy that you're tuned in with us today. Let me mention first that in addition to my prayers and message, there are three video links that are also associated with today's service. The first is Mike Kelly playing Christ the Lord is Risen Today on the Trumpet. When you click on that video, the words for that great Easter hymn by Charles Wesley show up on the screen. And I would click on that now as an opening hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Uh, following the prayer time is a good time for Emma Kelly's song, I'm Not Alone. It's an affirmation that God's presence is always with us. And the, the last musical link is Eric Marriott singing the Gaither hymn, Because He Lives. And I would do that song after the sermon. Christians around the world today are greeting each other with these famous words, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, on this Easter Sunday, we remember and rejoice in your victory over death. We remember and rejoice that your words of prediction were true, not just of your suffering, but of your resurrection. We remember and rejoice in your promises to us that we too will be given victory over death and the resurrection to come. We remember and rejoice that you came to give us life and life more abundantly. As we worship you today, wherever we are, we pray that you be with us and renew our faith and our strength in you. We rejoice and worship you this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pope John Paul II said, Do not abandon yourselves to despair. We are the Easter people, and hallelujah is our song. It's been wonderful to see the posts and pictures of crosses and yards by houses uh, as if we were, as if when we're not able to get together, uh, we still found a way to express our faith, express our remembering the suffering of Jesus and our rejoicing in the resurrection of Christ and that the expression simply could not be held back. They, and now they're, they're displayed in crosses outside of homes and in different uh, uh, arrangements of, of flowers and plants outside of your homes. And, I, and I'm encouraged to see all of those and see the pictures of them. I would also encourage you to call and greet people and share the Easter greeting. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. I can't guarantee that that handles Hallelujah Chorus will play every time you say that, but it might play in your minds. And before we pray together today, I would ask that you remember certain individuals who, who are in special need of prayer. I would ask that you remember Billy and Denise and the whole Gamlin family, as Billy Gamlin's mother, Mrs. Okia Gamlin, uh, passed away Thursday, April 9th. I would also ask that you remember the Bagwell family. Mr. Johnny Walker Bagwell passed away Monday. Johnny was a longtime teacher of the Fellowship Sunday School class, and he had notebooks and notebooks of his lessons there at his house and always said he was ready to teach when needed. Both the Gamlin and both Mrs. Gamlin and Mr. Bagwell were buried in private family graveside services. Let's also remember in prayer our president and, and the governor and all those who are tasked with leading us. I don't know how long we need to shelter at home. I don't know when this should end, but I pray that God will give wisdom and direction to our leaders. Let's also remember those who are suffering from this virus and especially those who are giving care to the suffering, the doctors and nurses and the whole medical teams. Would you bow your heads and pray with me at this time? Dear Lord, in this week of celebrating the resurrection, we affirm again our hope in the life to come. We pray that you'd comfort all of us who are grieving, departed loved ones. We pray especially for the Gamlin and the Bagwell families. Please, Lord, give wisdom and strength to our leaders and to all the medical teams giving care. And please, Lord, even in our separation and sheltering at home, 
Help us to continue to lift up one another and encourage one another and to be spiritual family to one another. And let us now pray together as Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The text for the message today is from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. The best picture in 1976 was a surprise movie called Rocky. It was about a boxer named Rocky Balboa, and he was dating a lady named Adrian, who lived with her brother, Paulie. Adrian, in, in one scene, Adrian invites Rocky over to Thanksgiving dinner, and uh, a fight begins to, an argument begins to break out. Uh, Paulie's been drinking, and he, and he starts saying things and starts yelling, and everything gets real uncomfortable. And then Paulie gets real upset, and he takes the turkey, and he flings it out in the front yard. And so the turkey is rolling out there in the, in the grass and snow. And, and at that point, Rocky and Adrian decide to go somewhere else to eat dinner. Adrian's really upset. Rocky tries to make her feel better. He says, listen, I don't want no turkey anyway, you know. Adrian says, but it was Thanksgiving. Rocky says, it was what? Adrian says, it was Thanksgiving. Rocky says, yeah, to you, but to me it's Thursday, right? Thursday was going by and it was no big deal. Thanksgiving was going by and it was no big deal to Rocky. It was just another day. Friends, there are people, millions of people to whom this Sunday is just another day. It's just Sunday, right? But we know better. We know more. This is Easter Sunday. On this date, nearly 2,000 years ago, the Lord of all creation came out of the tomb alive again. But suppose somebody was to say, so what? What difference does it make that Jesus rose from the dead? Why are Christians so excited about this anyway? What difference does it make? Let me give you three of the many reasons why Christians rejoice. Just three of the many reasons why we rejoice in the resurrection. First, we rejoice because Jesus was victorious. We who read of Jesus' life and ministry in the Gospels, of his healing people, of his walking on the water, of his teaching, of his parables, of his raising the dead, we read these stories, and it's as if we've met Jesus inside the sacred story. There's something phenomenal something amazing about the Gospels. As the scientist Albert Einstein is reported to have said, no one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates every word. No myth is filled with such life, end quote. And in meeting him, friends, we love it. And we grieve when we read of his suffering and death. But then we rejoice with Mary as she meets the risen Lord. C.S. Lewis describes a scene in his book, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, a scene that, that, that's a resurrection scene. In the story, it's set in World War II, and there are four children, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, 
and they step through a wardrobe into a different world, a world called Narnia, a world where animals can talk and where the king of beasts, the king of kings is a lion named Aslan, and the children are brought to meet him. One child asks, is he safe? Of course not, says Miss Beaver. He's not safe. He's a lion, but he's good. He's good. So in the story, the witch represents evil. She tricks one of the children and he betrays his brother and sisters. And there's a battle. And the witch claims to have the traitor's life, have Edmund's life. All traitors belong to him, belong to her. And she, so she wants him. She wants to kill him. Aslan meets with her in private and they negotiate a deal and the boy is let off. Aslan later that night walks as if weighed down by a heavy burden, the burdens of all the world, walks up a hill to a stone table, meets the witch. He's laid out on the table. She laughs and then she stabs him with a knife and kills him. The girls had secretly followed and they, and they were in shock and they wept quietly. And then when the witch and her crowd leaves, they go to the body and weep over his body for hours. Finally, they sit dazed, not talking, dazed from their grief. Dawn breaks and there is a, a sound of an earthquake and a crack. And they look and the table has been cracked in two, the table, the stone table where Aslan had been killed. But his body is missing. The girls are in shock and in grief again, but then Aslan comes and greets them. Aren't you dead, says Lucy. No longer, says Aslan. The atmosphere changes from grief to joy. The girls laugh. They romp around with the lion. Then he has them put their fingers in the ear, in their ears as he lets out a mighty roar, a roar of victory. Friends, you, you feel good reading that part of the lion, witch, and the wardrobe. You feel good knowing that it's an illustration of Jesus' victory. Part of Easter joy is simply rejoicing that Jesus wins. The minister and poet Philip Brooks, famous for writing the Christmas Carol, by the way, a little town of Bethlehem, has a short Easter poem. Philip Brooks wrote, Tomb thou shalt hold him, I'm sorry, Tomb thou shalt not hold him longer. Death is strong, but life is stronger. Stronger than the dark, the light, stronger than the wrong, the right, faith and hope, triumphant say, Christ will rise on Easter day. Friends, we rejoice with Jesus in his victory. Amen. We also rejoice that Jesus' words are not empty promises, but are rock solid promises. Jesus has many titles in the Bible. The Christ, Messiah, anointed one, the light of the world, Prince of Peace, King of Kings, Son of God, Emmanuel, I am, Bread of Life, Bridegroom, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, the Resurrection, the Way, the Truth, the Life, and many more titles, including the word cornerstone. Cornerstone. In a modern building, a cornerstone is mostly symbolic. It's a block marked with the year of construction, someplace where it can be seen. It's sometimes solid, but more typically today it's it's hollowed out with a metal box inside for newspapers, photographs, currency, books uh, from the date the stone was laid, from the date the building was, was built. Uh, but in times past, the cornerstone served a more cru crucial function for the building. Plans would be made for the building and designs would be drawn up and, and, and construction would be all set. And the builders would look at their plans and they look at the ground and their plans and the ground and then they go to the starting spot and lay the first stone. Everything this direction would have to line up with the stone. Everything going the other direction would have to line up with the stone. And vertically too, everything would have to line up with this cornerstone. The cornerstone gave direction in three different dimensions. It was a point of reference that kept everything straight. Jesus said that he was the cornerstone. Friends, joy can be found in building our lives on the cornerstone. We can have reason to hope, direction for living, knowledge that we're accepted by God as we build on the cornerstone. When I was in high school in the late 1970s, one of the popular bands was called Queen. It was a British rock band. I had several friends who had their tapes and wore t-shirts with Queen across the, the shirt. Their band there uh, would try to go to their concerts. Uh, would go around singing their songs. We are the champions and we will, we will rock you. Enormously successful group indu inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. 
Uh, two years ago, there was even a movie made about them called The Bohemian Rhapsody. Now, the lead singer of Queen was a man named Freddie Mercury. And one of his last songs on the Miracle album has this haunting lyric. He says, does anyone know what we're living for? Does anyone know what we're living for? Freddie Mercury died in 1991, just 45 years old, still seeking purpose for life. Friends, Jesus, the cornerstone, can give purpose to our lives. Jesus shared stories about who God is, like the prodigal son, uh, like the father in the prodigal son story. He shared stories about how we should care for each other, like the Good Samaritan caring for the injured person. He shared stories about the future and about how we're going to be judged by how much love we have for the least of these. He taught us to love our enemies, to pray even for those who, who work against us. Jesus taught us not to worry, but to trust in God as our Heavenly Father who cares for us. Jesus predicted he was going to, before he went to Jerusalem, he predicted he was going to be arrested and, and tried and abused and crucified and killed and that he would rise again on the third day. Jesus' words of prediction came true. He rose again on the third day, just as he said he would. And his resurrection validates all that he taught. He said that he was like solid rock, and those who build their lives on his words would be building their lives on solid ground. Friends, part of the Easter celebration, at least for me, isn't just that Jesus rose, but that his resurrection validates his teachings. And his teachings can become the rock of our lives. He can be our cornerstone. Our lives can have meaning as we build our lives confidently, confidently on his teachings. Lastly, of the many reasons we celebrate and rejoice that he is risen. But the last one for this message, and I'll grant you it might be a little selfish, but, but I rejoice, and perhaps you do too, I rejoice in the resurrection because Jesus said, we too will rise. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and will take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Friends, we rejoice in the resurrection because in Christ, we too have hope for resurrection. We too have hope for eternal life. Life here is just fleeting. Years go by. No one knows how long we have. But in Christ, we have hope that death is not the end. It's just the end of the beginning. Reverend Clarence Hall put it like this. He said, the resurrection of Jesus changes the face of death for all his people. Death is no longer a prison, but a passage to God's presence. And I think, friends, that when we no longer fear death, we can live more joyfully here, more joyfully in the moment, with more freedom here. Not worrying that life here will not go on forever, but trusting that the God who made this beautiful world has an even greater world in store for us in the future. A place where the grandeur and beauty of this world is only a hint at the world to come. As the Apostle Paul wrote, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So wherever you are today, I know, you know, this is not just another Sunday. This is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And we remember and rejoice in Jesus' victory and the victory that he gives to all of us. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. And hear now the words of the benediction. And now may the loving power of God, which raised Jesus from the dead, strengthen you in hope, enrich you in his love, and fill you with joy in the faith. Amen.